Hi there. This is the video I said I would make as a follow-up to the original video in which I reviewed this tent, which is the Vango Force 10 Xenon Ultralight 2. Um, I'm not going to go over any of the particular features and functions as I they're all in the original video. You may actually have come here from that video. Uh, what I do want to do is now to look back at the function of the tent in the light of experience. Um, to date, over two years ago, um, some of that time I was working so I didn't get out as much as I would have liked. Since then I fortunately no longer work full time. Um, but during that time I've had the chance to have um, a handful of three or four or five day tours. I had a 10 day tour here in the UK, they've all been in the UK. And then recently, just before all this unfortunate coronavirus pandemic uh, emerged, I was lucky to be away for uh, a 40, 45 day trip to Singapore and New Zealand. And during my time in New Zealand, I was on a cycle tour and spent just over just over a month where each night I spent in the tent. Um, most of that tour was on a day-to-day -day basis it would be pitching and striking the tent at a new campground. There were a couple of occasions where I was in the same campground and had a rest day so I didn't need to take the tent down. So it's I suppose about 28 to 30 um, strike and pitch the tent days. So I got a sense of how easy or difficult it is to pitch the tent um, and some of the aspects of the tent that pleased me and some of the aspects of the tent which left me a little bit uh, disappointed shall we say. Um, during the intervening period I've been very lucky in that a number of people have commented on the original video so by all means take a look at that because I think they, the comments from some people, uh, a handful of whom have had this tent and have used it in anger, um, can extend what I'm about to say. I suppose during the times that I've been away, I've been very lucky in one sense in that I've enjoyed largely good weather. I've never had to be in the tent in storm conditions uh, and only on a couple of occasions have I um, been in the tent while it's been particularly um, rainy conditions so with a particularly heavy rainfall so that's great if you're away cycle touring perhaps less so if you want to be able to comment on how the tent functions under those conditions um, so you might want to check out a couple of the other commenters who have said that they've been in uh, off conditions in, in the, um, the highlands of Scotland or Wales and have found the tent to be, in their, wor their words, bomb-proof. Um, I'd perhaps... Um, I'd, be, I'd be less confident, I think, um, um, based on the experience that I've uh, had, particularly whilst I was in New Zealand. I was very lucky, as I said, I had weather like this for almost the entire month. Um, there were only a couple of occasions when it rained lightly and I had very few uh, occasions where um, it uh, was particularly br windy. The most I had was a stiff breeze to contend with and the tent was fine under those conditions. Uh, one thing I would say is it is particularly hot today and that's how it often was in New Zealand. Um, the ventilation is not fantastic on this tent. Yes, you can get the door open, but if it happens to be a particularly humid night, um, I'm reticent to leave the door entirely open if there's likely to be the possibility of rainfall in the forecast. So it's a matter of just leaving a slot open at the top for ventilation. Uh, and under warmer, humid conditions, the tent can get very muggy. It certainly, and a couple of people in the comments in the previous video have said, how poor it is for condensation on the inside. Um, 
It certainly is on, on cold conditions. In, if it's not particularly breezy and you don't get a flow through of air, then yes, condensation does build up quite significantly. Um, that means that you do need to be able to drop the inner so that the inner doesn't get wet when you need to drop the tent as a whole. Uh, that's not a particularly big deal, I found it was quite simple to do. It's a matter of, um, I don't know whether you'll be able to see this, but over here there are some clips. Uh, and it's a matter of just unclipping these all the way around. The inner drops down and I used to bundle that in a separate um, dry bag. Uh, and then at least the inner stayed dry for when you re-pitched it. The tent itself was fairly quick to dry perhaps understandably so in conditions like this. Because I didn't have much rain, when it did get wet as a result of condensation, they were the times then, they were the times under which I was able to see the performance of the fabric. Uh, and whilst I never had, because I didn't have too much rain, any uh, ingress of water, um, the water on the inside could cause problems as a result of other design aspects of the tent. So what I'd like to do now is to take us through a couple of those and you can see what I'm talking about. So let's go take a look. Okay, so the first thing I think I'd want to point out is that you can see today that it's barely breezy, there's a mild breeze blowing. I've not got the tent with the guy ropes extended apart from one so that takes away some of the tension in the fabric um, some people in the comments on the original video said how worried they were that it wouldn't stand up to particularly harsh windy conditions um, from what i've read tunnel tents are supposed to be fairly robust but it does require them to be pitched in the right orientation so you'd want the tail of the tent to be facing into the wind and of course that's not always possible um, depending on the ground underneath depending on the land that you've got available and the fact that wind often doesn't prevail from a single direction of course it often swirls around particularly on campsites if, or you know, in re more remote conditions so one of the first things I would say is that this section down the side here is an incredibly long run of fabric and if we take a look down here a little bit more closely at this section uh, if I put my hand under you can see how maybe see how far that moves out it's very and of course it moves in and you can now see the inner being exposed so what I would want, I think, is an extra pegging point along the side so that you can actually anchor that down a little bit more firmly and stop the inside flapping on to, sorry, stop the tent fly sheet flapping onto the inner, especially if it starts to get wet on the inside uh, from condensation that I mentioned earlier. So, as we were just taking a look down the side of the tent there and how much um, give there is in the tent wall, uh, particularly when it's not under tension, and that increases of course when the tent gets wet, it's a sill nylon tent, and that does tend to extend or expand uh, when it uh, get, becomes moisture laden. Um, this is another section of the tent where I noticed that that's a particular problem and maybe it could be assisted by adjusting the design somewhat. There seems to be too much material here. So if we take a look at this tent wall, uh, you can see how much it moves in and out. There's a lot of give there. Now of course we can, using this guy, tension it up slightly, but, but there's a limit to how far you can pull that um, and make it more tense and the reason I found is due to the fact that I'm using uh, one of the fitted footprints which is anchored at each of the corners in the different sections of the tent by an elastic so let's take a look at that and you'll see what I mean if we just slacken this off for a minute in fact let's take it off completely if we look under here 
I think you can make that out. That's where the footprint is anchored. And it's anchored by this elastic. So that when you try to tension up this section of tent, there's only a limit to how far you can take it. So what I found I had to start doing was unhooking that. Where are we? There. And then that meant that I could get a little bit more tension in the side wall of the tent. And that's a little bit better than it was before. Whilst we're at the rear of the tent, let me point something else out. Um, I tended to use the rear guy line most of the time, um, just to maintain tension and pull the tent fly sheet away from the inner, so there was less chance of uh, internal condensation getting onto the air. However, if you take a look up at the design of this and look at this hood across the um, ventilation panel, which is uh, no see and mesh just on the inside of there, and the way this guy sheet operates by pulling out both of these points, mm. you can see what the problem is. I've got this guy pulled out and pegged as far as way as pretty much as far away as I can. If you want to introduce some more tension, watch what happens to the hood. It tends to pull down on the hood and reduce the amount of ventilation that you've got. It's even worse if, let me just take that out, you're pitching closer to the tent, sorry, you're pegging closer to the tent. So what I'd like to see is some way of keeping that hood open but you, that you're still able to use this rear guy line. That would be particularly the case, I suppose, if it was windy. Although I guess if it's windy, maybe ventilation becomes less of an issue. If the wind's coming from this direction and hitting the tent, causing you to need this guy line, then maybe you're less worried about having the hood wider open to allow for more ventilation, maybe. So there's some of the things I'd say about the rear of the tent. I've got one other comment or two to go and take back to the front to take a look at those. The other thing I wanted to say a little bit about is dropping the inner while the tent fly sheet is still pitched. It's a relatively easy thing to do, but it did create a problem for me, which I'll come to in a second. As I said before, if the inner if the tent fly sheet got particularly wet as a result of condensation. Um, I would often drop the inner. Um, it's a fairly straightforward matter of unhooking these seven connectors that are around the uh, perimeter of the inner. It's a two-handed job but let's give it a go and see if I can manage this with one. So we take these off um, one by one and you can have the inner down uh, probably in about three or four minutes. However, you've seen how relatively straightforward that is and it's even easier with two hands. That created a problem for me, which I'll come back to. One morning with a wet uh, fly sheet, I decided to drop the inner and I was just popping off the little elastic clips that you saw me doing just a short while ago and this happened. Now, I don't know whether you can see that. There's a rather severe um, tear in the sleeve for the tent pole. And you might also be able to see that there's a, a rather distinct bulge there, between there and there. One morning, all I was doing was unclipping the inner elastics that you saw earlier on and there was this almighty crack and one of the tent poles had snapped just at the point where I was popping off that elastic. It then tore through and created the tear that you can see in the sleeve. That bulge that you can see is one of the repair tubes they provide two with the tent, fortunately, uh, very thoughtful of them to do so. and. Subsequently, whenever I pitched the tent, I had to put that sleeve tube on. Luckily, 
it was right towards the end of the tour it became incredibly difficult to actually try and thread uh, the sleeve uh, sorry the splint through the tent fabric sleeve because it's much it's a much wider diameter than the poles themselves and it only just fits through the tent sleeve um, so now I'm faced with the prospect of repairing this um, fortunately I'm now home and I've been able to I'll just show you Here we are, I bought a replacement set of poles. One would have been fine, but they come in sets of five. They also come with elastic, so if you do need to, um, if you do need to replace the elastic, and that could easily have happened. Um, so I shall be um, repairing this pole after this video, uh, this broken pole, and I'll be replacing it with one of these. These are a standard size, they're much longer than um, each of the sections in the tent pole overall so I'll need to cut this to length I'll obviously need to take out the elastic that might be a bit awkward maybe there's a video in that so I hope you've enjoyed this review um, I guess the final question is um, will I be continuing to use the tent uh, as soon as I've repaired the pole of course the answer is yes um, I'm still happy with most of the tent. The space is incredible inside. There's so much room for all your kit um, when you're using this two-person tent uh, and there's only yourself. So that's a really helpful thing. It's fairly lightweight. It's easy to pack away even when wet. Um, there's an awful lot about it that I like that make it useful. Uh, those people who have used the tent in worse conditions than me have commented on the previous video how they found it was up to the task so that gives me a little bit of confidence what I may do in future is cut an extra one of these to length and carry it along with me these aren't particularly heavy so it wouldn't add a great deal to the weight but then at least I know I've got something in hand if the pole did crack again um, but I will also be looking for another tent, uh, I'm not quite sure what yet, but something that does allow a little bit more flow through of air, uh, perhaps uh, a tent with two entrances so that you can open both up if you need to and get plenty of air running through. That's the one thing with this one, you would not want to be sitting inside the tent on a day like today. Um, anyway but let's say you wanted to take a nap if you had a particularly bad day the day before and you're, you're feeling ill and you wanted somewhere inside in the shade to lie down that wouldn't be inside this tent it would be far too hot because there's just not that ventilation okay thank you very much for watching if you do have any observations like the folks did before please leave them in the comments and I'll do my best to get back to you thanks a lot and bye